Welcome today, everyone, to our webinar about mini split heat pumps for cooling. Yes, everybody is thinking about air conditioning right now and how to cool your home. Mini split heat pumps can be used for cooling and heating existing homes. Um, and Dave Petroy is going to tell you tell us a little bit more about that today. We have a presentation that will last about 30 plus minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions after that. So. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you put those in the Q&A box, and we'll remind you a few times through the webinar um, in the chat that that's where we'd like to see your questions. Um, so feel free to type those in there throughout the webinar. We want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors for being a part of this webinar. So Walking Mountain Sustainability, Holy Cross Energy, High Country Conservation Center, Garfield Clean Energy, the Energy Smart Colorado Program, the Beneficial Electrification League of Colorado, and the Community Office for Resource Efficiency. So another other few um, housekeeping items today, we will send a follow-up email that will, that will include this recording of the webinar, so you can reference it later or share it out with friends. Um, and just a reminder to put those questions in the Q&A box. I'm gonna tell you just quickly about Dave, our speaker. Um, Hang tight. My screens all went away, I apologize. So David Petroy is our speaker today. He's gonna to share information about mini split heat pumps and heat pumps in general. He has over 15 years experience in a range of renewable energy, sustainability and business roles. Um, he worked for a long time with ground source heat pumps and the engineering design for those and installation of ground source heat pumps. Um, He's done over 200 installations throughout Colorado of those. He also led technical sales of solar and energy power systems in the early 2000s. And most recently, he was the sustainability manager for, for Golden Alu Aluminum, one of the largest single site industrial power users in Colorado. He was responsible for leading adoption and implementation of a facility-wide energy monitoring system and upgrades to reduce energy consumption on large industrial production processes. In 2017, he launched NTS Energy, which is what he does now. It's a consulting company focused on providing advanced HVAC and solar solutions to homeowners and small commercial companies, um, promoting the transition to a new energy economy in, in Colorado. Dave holds an MS in geophysics from Washington University in St. Louis and a BS in zoology from SUNY Oswego. Oswego. And Dave, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks for being here with us today. And we'll have some questions for you when you're, you're done talking. Great. Thanks, Nikki. And thanks to all the sponsors. <clears throat> and welcome, everyone. Um, and Nikki said I got about 35 minutes of uh, some slides here to go through. And uh, let me just quickly, we're going to talk about um, everything from how the heat pumps work to what mini splits are. We're going to try to really dig into to home strategies, so ways for you to think about how you might use these with your homes. We'll talk about the costs and the savings, and then um, I don't know why it went back here, but um, and then we'll talk about how to get a good heat pump system. Lots of different advice and topics on vendors, etc. So let's go to the first one. So a heat pump, <clears throat> just real quickly, is it moves energy, it extracts energy. It's a it's a two way air conditioning system. So rather than um, in the summer, you know, air conditioners, I don't know why this keeps doing this, but we'll have to figure that out. Um, rather than uh, move heat from your house to outside in the summer, it, it reverses in the winter. And so this is just a basic idea. So this would be the winter. These would be an indoor unit. This would give the heat to your house. This is an equivalent sort of outdoor unit from a mini split. Down here, I've got kind of a... Uh, this would be replacing your furnace in a ducted system. And this looks like an air conditioner, but it's a, it's a heat pump there. And so really all it is, and I'm not going to go into the details. I used to spend five minutes explaining this, but basically you have a refrigerant in the winter. It absorbs heat from the outdoor air. It's absorbing heat, not temperature. So even when it's cold, it can suck a lot of heat in. It goes in, it gets, we add energy, we compress it. It's a warm gas, goes into the house. It goes into these units, blow a little air by it, heats your house, and it just reverses in the summer. I, I can point you to videos if you want to get into a lot more detail of that. So the big thing, the reason we're here is the heat pumps have dramatically improved over the last decade. 
Um, and it's, it's very interesting. I'm calling around the, the turn of the century, I'm calling it the birth of cold climate heat pumps. And really I should say in North America, uh, in Japan in particular, and in Europe, they've been working on them for longer than that. What happened? I don't know why this is doing this. Hold on. A sec. Oh, um, hang on a second. Let me see something because I think the slideshow is progressing and I don't want it to do that. Um, okay, let's go back. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> So what happened in North America, their New England prices of oil went up, et cetera. Everyone was like, there's no reason these can't work in cold climates. So there was a lot of effort into making them work in, in cold situations, defrosting. How can we make them work when it's really cold out? Um, what can we do to improve them? And so there was all these efforts. And then over the last 10, 12 years, they've been installed throughout North America, <clears throat> all, uh, all throughout New England, the Canada cold areas, and also in, uh, in Colorado. And what did they do? I'm not going to go into details. They basically engineers had every component inside an air conditioner with a reversing valve, um, which is a heat pump, to fix and, and improve. And the big things were the compressors. It used to be compressors were kind of this on-off, maximum off. Now they have scroll compressors. So compressors are very smart. They can just use enough energy to heat your house to the amount you need. If it's 50 degrees, I don't need a lot of heat. If it's zero, you need a lot. The other big thing was um, obviously a lot of defrosting technology. The other thing is computer control. So inside the house, you have these mini split units all around, and now they can talk to the compressor. And so basically, if you have one room that needs a lot of heat, another room needs a little bit of heat, they can tell the compressor, I need this much heat total. So that technology enabled it to really um, save a lots of energy. Uh, two, so a couple of big results of all that technology advancement. This is a graph of outdoor temperature. The left is zero degrees. The right is 70 degrees, <clears throat> excuse me. And the green line is um, how much energy it takes to heat a house. Um, and so the green line is 60, doesn't take much. It increases to, to 60,000 BTUs per hour when it's really cold out. Now, so heat pumps, the old heat pumps, this thin blue line, that's how much heating they put out. And down to about 32 degrees, they could heat, they could fulfill the requirement. They match the green line, but nobody really cared. It was only in mild climates that we used. But now, Basically what happened over time, so it was short, but over time they kept advancing these heat pump technology over the last, you know, in the early part of the 2000s. So now the orange line is more characteristic. Basically it holds the capacity all the way to zero and, and beyond even with the really good cold climate heat pumps. So now you have the ability to use the heat pump. There's a little bit short here, but that can be made up with a little electrical or, or even you size it up a little bit and it basically can, do all the capacity. So that's A, they work below 32 and they can produce a lot of heat. B was how effective and efficient they do it. So this is starting around 2012 and all the way up to 2020. HSPF is called, uh, term heating season performance factor. The higher the number, the better. Eight, double, eight is twice as efficient as four. So to give you an idea, it was around eight back then, now it's up, the highest is 13, but cold climate heat pumps are all in this range here. They're, every manufacturer has a bunch available in the 10 to 11 range, which is about 28% more efficient than they used to be. So basically think about it again, one third less the cost than only eight to 10 years ago. So <clears throat> it, two big improvements. So summarizing, big efficiency improvements, they're able to defrost, so we don't have to worry when they're out in the cold rain and freezing. Capability to provide heat below zero. So a lot of these cold climate units can go down to negative 13, negative 15, higher capacities and efficiencies at these cold temperatures. So these four things combined means that we can actually use them in all the climate zones of Colorado. So I think maybe most of you are familiar with 
mini splits, but they're also called ductless heat pumps. So one unit is outside and you run these refrigerant lines to multiple units inside the house. And it used to be simple like this, just units on the walls. Now you can do up to five units indoor. Each zone's independent. You don't need much of a lot of space to run these lines in existing houses. And in fact, you can run them along the outside of the house as long as they're well insulated and in conduit and protected. Um, you've got a variety of options aside from wall units, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. So there's different styles of units. So that's what mini split, multi-zone mini split ductless system. I'll just tell you the big advance in all this, really, it was very difficult to figure out how to control all the refrigerants and all the refrigerant pressures when you have various multiple units turning on and off. So it was kind of a big technology advancement when it first came out. So we... The, the first thing is there's the wall units and there's something called the floor units um, for people, I guess, who don't want them high in the wall. Um, these are two that are more, more recent, um, more recent being in the last, you know, eight years or so. This is a uh, recessed ceiling unit. These were originally deployed in the, in the uh, commercial world and drop ceilings. And now they've, they've, really taken off in residential applications. And then this is a slim duct unit, only nine to 11 inches wide. It can be ducted. And so you don't have to have anything in the walls. You can just have supply grills here. And, and uh, we'll talk more about that, but that's what's nice. These can be up in the attic or they can be below the floor and, um, in the main floor to be to heat the, the, the main floor. So you can do second floor, main floor from those. This is actually rather new is a full air handler, which you can fully duct, but can be used in combination with one outdoor unit. And you can have one of these and maybe one or two of these other units. This is something that's just in the last couple of years. We're not gonna talk a lot about this because we're really focused on retrofitting existing homes in the mountain with sort of radiant baseboards or radiant in-floor heating. Um, you know, and this requires a, somewhat of a duct system. But for new homes, we'll talk about that in an upcoming seminar. And also for the existing homes replacing a uh, ducted system, they have uh, brought a lot of flexibility. So I wanna just touch on each of these units, just a couple high level things to think about. So the wall units are the least expensive indoor units. They're very good for small rooms. And if you look at the manufacturers, they have some now of them have more stylish ones. Some have, you know, curved ones, some look like mirrors, et cetera. So they are putting a more thought into the aesthetics of these as opposed to just the white box. They're good for middle floors because you don't have to have space above or below. Um, and they're good for smaller spaces because like I said, they're most economic. Couple things about this. These are nice because you've got louvers, you've got airflow in four directions. Some of the smarter ones can even, you can control the airflow here. You can say, well, I don't want the airflow coming on my head. I want it in three directions. They're good for, for large rooms. You can place them in the middle. And basically some of these have really advanced sensors where they can sense when people are in the room, they can sense body temperature. You get very sophisticated and it comes from the, the commercial setting use where they would have meetings and lots of people. And so this thing throttles down and throttles up. Um, and the residential applications are not quite there yet, but they're very um, excellent. You need space above, so they're gonna be good for second floor um, applications or sometimes in main floors and in areas where you have some false ceilings above. The main one thing about this, just sort of a weird side note is the, the temperature sensors up in here. So for a lot of applications, you'll wanna have the contractor like install a remote thermostat. So in this case, you know, you might say, well, the bed's most important. I'm just gonna put my thermostat over here. So this is where it's gonna sense the optimal temperature. Um, these are great units. Uh, the, a couple of things about them is they are the bigger, they do now make some that fit between 16 and studs. They're kind of small capacity. These bigger ones, you sort of have to box out, um, but still even doing that, not a huge installation issue and uh, really can be valuable. And these are just alternative to high wall units. I don't really have a lot to say about that. These though, <clears throat> slim ducted units 
have a couple of real nice advantages. And one of the things I think is if you've got two small bedrooms that you want to want to do with the heat pump, you've got a closet space or an attic above, you can actually use one of these with a limited amount of ducting. Remember, we're trying to not, in, in existing homes, we're trying to not a lot, put a lot of extra effort into sort of distribution systems, et cetera. So now with one of these units, you can actually do a couple of rooms and they're similar, which is real nice. The other thing is, even if it's one room and you don't want to see um, the, the heat pump unit, you can do this and you're going to just see the, the air grill. So, and then for the main floors, for very big rooms, you can put these in the basement. They're very slim and actually have um, grills and vents and you can do larger rooms in the, in the main floor, or you can find spots above, like depending on the structure or house, places where they can fit in to do that. So these, I think are a great advancement. The size and the flexibility is really useful. So you've got, you've got all those tools and your, your, heat, your contractor has those tools. And when we talk about new homes, you know, for design, you've got all these tools. So let's talk about up in the high country, you've got your in-floor radiant, you've got your baseboards, et cetera. And so you know, why would you want to think about these mini splits? Well, there's a couple reasons. One would be to add cooling to certain rooms, second floor, main section of a house. If you're going to add cooling, you might as well add the heat pump, the energy efficiency, the savings versus propane electric. There's no use just getting a simple air conditioner one. There's no use getting the one-way unit, especially with the rebates. You would pay more. The other thing is a lot of you might be wanting to reduce your heating costs um, in addition to add cooling, or you might have a priority uh, with regards to you know my contribution to local air pollution out of my house or my contribution to GHGs, I really want to go more energy efficient, uh, more renewable, and and these will show economics. You know the savings is tremendous. Um, for those of you who have a smaller home or a condo, you might want to convert from electric to propane to heat pumps. So you might want to basically convert eighty to ninety percent. Um, and basically try to get rid of your old system, go with the pure, pure heat pump system. And the other one is new additions. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about new construction in the fall, but I'll just, I'll touch on new additions because um, it really makes sense to consider these as opposed to, as an option to expanding your existing system. There are, there are nice advantages. To it. So you're thinking about your home <clears throat> and you're out there and you have, some motivation, maybe, maybe you're doing a remodel too. Um, but, you know, main thing, if you want cooling and increased comfort, that's going to define which rooms you're going to do. If you want to do savings on your heating bill and emissions reduction, then you're going to maybe think out of the box a little bit. And really a key thing is what's the largest volume rooms in your home that can be served with a couple of indoor units? because each indoor unit obviously adds two to 3,000 to the cost. So if you can basically do a bigger volume room with lesser of these indoor units, it's gonna end up being uh, a more cost-effective strategy to some extent. Um, cooling and comfort, I think what you wanna do is think about a little bit harder. Uh, let's say I look at my house and say, you know, my whole second floor, it's uncomfortable, I wanna cool it all. But, um, let's say you have four bedrooms up there. You might want to really think about, okay, um, if I cool the master and two others, this third room, do I really, fourth room, do I really need that cool? Cause the floor is going to be cool. Um, or maybe do I have a closet between or an attic? Can I use these slim ducted units? Maybe I can do two rooms and two rooms and then the master. So you really want to think about, um, which rooms are the priority? And then you're gonna to wanna to talk with a contractor. And I, I tell you, it's somewhat of a toss up whether it makes sense sometimes to do two units, in, one in each room, or whether it makes sense to do this slim duct with little ducts. It really depends on the specific of the home. Um, and, I, and I suggest for master bedrooms, you consider these recessed units because they're very nice. <clears throat> um, so if you have a small home or a condo, uh, you know, you've got a lot of rooms. I mean, you've got your sort of living room, you've got your kitchen, you know, you've got one or two bedrooms, you've got an office, you've got hallways, you've got two or three, couple bathrooms, a laundry room, et cetera. Now, it doesn't make sense 
to do bathrooms and all these tiny rooms, each one having these little little units around. Or even if you try, you know, these these sort of slim ducks, it doesn't make sense to do them for teeny rooms. So you really want to say, all right, what are the four or five largest rooms I'm going to do? I got to think, work with my contract. That's the strategy I'm going to use um, to do that. And so really, it's, it's kind of a fun, it's kind of a fun game. You look at the great room, you look at sort of the big kitchen, living room area and say, all right, where's the walls? What makes sense? What do I like? I don't want on this wall. I want it on that wall. Um, is it big enough to do the whole area comfortably? I got to do two opposite walls. Can I hide the duct one in a closet, uh, up above a closet, and do vents, et cetera? So that's what you start to think about in terms of doing, doing the whole, most of the house and getting to sort of a mini split system. Remodels are a little bit easier. Obviously, you know, you're, <clears throat> everything's open. You can do what you want. Some thoughts. When you're extending your existing system, you know, there's a couple things. If you have to upsize your core heating system, that's going to cost a lot. If you got to upsize the boiler or if you have to upsize, we're not talking about ducted, but let's say the furnace, um, it's radiant. Now you got to lay more in four pipes. You got to, you got to do more baseboards. You got to have controllers. You got to have zone controllers. So there's a lot there versus really um, looking at one of these mini split cold climate heat pumps. If you can locate it really close to the, to the new addition, you can do short runs. Now you've got cooling in addition to heating, great climate control. You've got air filtering in it. So um, I'm not gonna say it's always the choice, but I'm gonna say probably if you do comparisons in a lot of cases, you're gonna end up um, liking this as, as an option to just saying, well, let's just extend the old heating system. So it all sounds great, but the question is, you know, what does it cost? And is it, you know, is it going to save me money? Um, so the costing, um, and I'm going to talk about electric and propane because in a way it's almost becomes a no brainer in, in terms of how much money you save. And the way to look at it is pretty basic. It's called the coefficient of performance COP is um, how much energy in and how much energy out. And so uh, propane boiler, that's 95% is a COP of 0.95. I can burn my gas at 95% efficiency. I get 95% of the energy out of burning that gas. Electric heat resistance heat is really one-to-one. -one. Basically, all the energy going in comes out as electric resistance heat. Heat pumps have an average of about three cold climate heat pumps. So basically, Three units of energy moved, three units of heating energy moved for every one unit of electricity in. So it's using only about 33% of the energy. Um, and so for whatever portion of your home you decide to heat with a mini split heat pump system, you're going to save 65 to 70%. No matter what the price of electricity versus electricity. In fact, if electricity goes up 10% more, you're still going to save 65, 70% but the dollar value is going to be 10% more. Now with propane at about 230 a gallon, it's kind of funny. It's around the same amount of savings, but it's a wider range. You know, propane can go down. It can go up a lot more. It's, you know, it's somewhat even more valuable than NG. So, you know, that number might really range from say 55 to 80, depending on any given year or any given three year period. So, <clears throat> you're still going to have substantial savings. It's just not going to be the consistent percentage, but it's going to be a lot. <clears throat> These two pretty pictures I'm going to come back to after the next slide, because um, I know a lot of you are going to uh, probably have natural gas and you're thinking, well, what about natural gas? Dude? So let me move to the next slide. And so what I try to do is give application examples. So, um, so the first example would be, um, I really want to, um, I want to have some cooling, but, but sort of my drivers are, I want to save money on my bill. I want to be more energy efficient. I want to be less, you know, polluting. I want to, I want to do all those things. So I've decided I found the biggest area of my main floor and I'm going to do that with a mini split. And this just is a really rough ballpark square feet. So I'm going to do, um, 
you know, two tons and I'm going to do two indoor units. Might be on the walls, might be a couple different things, but this is sort of, you know, kind of a standard configuration. And I'm going to, this is, and so with Manual J, you build the house. Manual J, and I'll talk about it later, is the accepted way. Everyone in the HVAC industry, that's the standard you're supposed to model and, and figure out how much things cost and the run. So, you know, you've got electric baseboard heating, which is expensive. You've got propane boiler. Um, and then this is, once again, it's about, you know, one third the cost of this, a little bit less here, a few percent difference. But, you know, you're going to get quite a bit of savings. Now, let's look at the scenario where you're, you're in the mountains and you're saying, you know, I'm sick of 95. I'm just tired of it. Upstairs. I'm tired. I can't sleep. I'm going to do my three upstairs bedrooms. I'm going to do a mini split heat pump. I'm going to put in it. It's about the same size system, but I'm going to have three units. I got roughly the same savings because about the same area. Um, <clears throat> so same savings. Now I've got a couple other scenarios. Let's say I've got a condo or a single story home. I'm tired of paying my super high electric bills or I'm on my propane boiler. And I really want to move off of that. Um, so I've got uh, a three ton unit. I can do four indoor units. So for electric ones, you might leave small rooms with electric. For the boiler, you know, you can leave a few of the small rooms on the boiler. You know, if you wanted to totally get rid of the boiler, you could put a little electric um, heating in, the, in those rooms. Um, that would be the most cost effective. But once again, a bigger area, bigger system, bigger savings. And then the final one would be, you've got a, you know, a pretty decent sized house. You're gonna do the upstairs. Um, you're going to do three to four bedrooms. You're going to do big rooms downstairs. You're going to do like your kitchen, your living room. Uh, maybe it's a big area with a dining room, a couple thousand square feet total. I've got a four ton unit and I've got five of these indoor units I can play with them. I can put them where I want. Um, so more savings here. So let's see. All right. How much does this stuff cost? So down here, I've got the same four scenarios. I've just duplicated this over here. And then I've got system costs and, you know, the price of going up to put these things in. But so this is a small unit with two tons. So the price really is ranging from, you know, 11.5 to 25.5 for the bigger system. But up in your part of the state, you've got uh, really great the utility and walking mountains. Everyone is really, um, you know, realizes the inherent overall long term advantages of these systems um, for holy costs it's a it's a good it's a good for their system so there's you've got a lot of rebates which really helps pay for a lot of this cost and so in the end between these savings and the rebates you end up sort of in the three versus electric in the three and a half to six year range you get your money back propane it's about a half year a half year more realize though with the way prices are you know you're kind of hedging either way because if if Holy Cross raises there, and this is at 11 cents. So if this goes to 13 cents, you know, if it goes up another 10%, your these numbers go up 10% that year. Um, same with up or down here too. So now let me talk about gas and I'm going to go back. So if your motivation is purely cost savings, then it just it's not, you know, it's not going to do it for you. I'll explain that. If you have a combination of motivation, if you say, I want cooling, um, or I want cooling and I want to reduce my emissions footprint, um, you know, I want to be more green. You know, if you have these multiple reasons, then there's a really good strategy with it. And here's why. At the current pricing of natural gas, <clears throat> um, Basically, down to around 30 degrees, heat pumps are cost on par with heating for gas. Because this COP, the, the warmer it is, the higher this is. It's, it's much easier for heat pumps to get heat energy out of air that's 40 or 50 degrees. When it gets down colder, 10 degrees, 5 degrees, this <clears throat> COP goes lower. So the bottom line is, this is a graph here of the temperature and eagle over the seasons. So really what happens is in the months of September and October, down to about the beginning of November, these two months, 
It's actually heating with a heat pump or heating with a natural high efficiency natural gas boiler is basically a wash. You get into this part, the gas boiler is still warm. You do these months in here. So basically the four kind of fall, spring, intermediate months, you have a mini split heat pump. You're heating more energy efficient wise. So if that's a goal, if the goal is cooling, you've got that. Um, and then what you can do is in the winter, you're basically back to your more traditional system. If you want to keep the floor warm in these seasons, you can keep the radiant on. You just keep it a lot lower and let the mini split do most of the work. The other advantage is it is a hedge against fluctuating energy prices. If gas prices go up, you've got size right, you can run this more into February. You can run it more into November, December. If gas prices go down, you can back it off a little bit. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. So that's kind of the story with, with natural gas at the moment. So let's talk about doing a good heat pump system because um, you know <clears throat> it's fantastic technology. It's got all the flexibility you want. So let's talk about how to get a good system, what you need to think about. So um, historically, and you might even hear up, up there, you know, rumors, or not rumors, stories spread fast. Stories of things not working spread faster than stories of things working. But here's common things that usually cause issues. First of all, it really wasn't a cold climate heat. Um, you know, there's sort of the original warm climate heat pump, and then there's some that are kind of in between um, two speed, et cetera, but they're really not going to be able to hold that temperature at zero, that capacity at zero and work down to minus 13. The other thing is it wasn't made, it wasn't sized big enough. Um, you know, if you're going to have all your, if you're going to keep some of your electric baseboard in there, you had size of a minus six, but if you're really going to wipe, throw everything away, throw all your propane boiler away, et cetera, you know, then you need to size it for when it's really cold. Um, and that's the, the purple point, the temperature. So the result is either the outdoor unit's too small, or in the case of these, the indoor unit's too small. And that's where it's the same as like a radiant heating system. Be like, I got a big enough boiler, but I know even in radiant homes sometimes, oh, that room isn't quite comfortable or that one. Generally, they're good, but that's another issue. But finally, poorly installed system because there's certain things, you know, when the system's running at zero degrees, um, it works very well, but, you know, you can't have uninsulated lines and stuff like that. So um, poorly installed system. And I guess I, I'll talk about a little bit later, sort of the three levels of installed. And so, you know, you might talk to people and they say, oh, it doesn't work when it's super cold or it costs more to heat than was expected. So when you're out there, how do you know it's a cold climate heat pump? <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's kind of funny. It'd be great if the manufacturers on their website said cold climate heat. And also there's a bunch of debate about what exactly is cold climate. Well, um, basically if it's got an HSPF of 10 plus, a SEER 18 plus, you're pretty much a cold climate heat pump. And that's why a lot of people gear rebates to those numbers. The other thing is if you go on any of these websites, you see variable speed compressor, you see operates really well below zero or holds capacity at minus five, at five degrees or zero. Um, and then, you know, the better contractors, you just chat with them and they'll, they'll be like, yeah, this is the cold climate. Um, and then if it meets the utility rebate requirements for cold climate, you know, a list or they'll check it. So um, those are some of the ways. If you want to go online and read about, you know, how people promote it, what they talk about it, these are some of the brand examples. Hyperheat, Aurora, Elgrid, um, Halocene, XLTH. So if you go online and read about these um, these series, these are their cold climates. The other thing is you want to make sure that um, they're quiet too. And I'll tell you, the really good high-end cold climate ones are going to be quiet. It's like they're going to build a great product. The indoor units, I've slept in many bedrooms with these things running. And when they're on, they're, you can't really hear them at all. Um, and the, out, the outdoor units are a lot quieter than they used to be. But I'm not going to say they're quiet. I mean, 
imagine the best air conditioning these days. They'll say it's quiet, um, but you want to you want you know ask for the specs. Say, well, how loud is it? What is it? Be? And then I'll talk a little more about warranty, particularly the compressor warranty. Um, you know, when they put a good warranty out, they have a good product. <clears throat> this is kind of the, the real trick. Well, then how do I know, how do you as a consumer know when you have three or four people come into your house and they'll give you quotes and they'll say, oh, it's this or that. How do you really know? Well, the main thing is that they do a manuals J heating and cooling mode. All right, did you do manual J on my house and get an estimate? Now, some of them who are really good, they might say, yeah, well, yeah, we did we did a quick manual J, um, you know, we know, but talk to them. How did you get the right design for the different rooms? Um, and what temperature did you design down to? You know, if, if you're going to have, you know, if you got electric heat in your house and you're going to have still, still there, um, you know, you might not have to design the minus 13, but if you're going to throw away all your propane, not having any more, then you got to, you got to make sure the capacity is bigger to go really cold. And if your heating load is, if it's between two sizes, always go for the bigger size. And I'll tell you, 99.999% of the contractors will automatically do it because they don't want to take the risk of being undersized. Um, so this is a little bit about terminology. Um, the term is tons. It doesn't mean weight. It means heating capacity. And it's basically 12,000 BTU per hour is the heating capacity. Um, and so two tons is 24, et cetera, et cetera. Four tons is 48. The way to know when you look at your quotes is in the long model numbers. I probably should put an example or two up here. You'll see like 024, 030, 036, 0448. That's how you know, oh, that's a three ton unit, 36,000. Um, and this gives you a little bit of an idea, just roughly, of how many, how many uh, rooms it might do. To give you an idea, houses in general, um, newer houses, three to four tons, you know, older houses, four, five, six tons, seven tons. So it gives you an idea of, of just ranges. And then indoor units, same terminology, but there's going to be small rooms. So they're going to be, oh, I only need a little bit, a half ton, one ton, one and a half tons. And this just kind of gives you ideas of just very roughly what, what's a room going to take. Um, going a little slow. I'm almost done. Um, selecting a contractor, I'd say the resources that sponsored this talk, there's a slide in there, talk to them. They've been working with the contractor community in the high country. They know everyone who's the players and who's doing it. Um, you can look at the manufacturer's websites and they always say who's, our, you know, you can select who's like the star certified installers. Um, I always, one thing I recommend is you kind of look on their website of the contractor. Do they, do they even have mini splits on their thing? Do they talk about heat pumps? So they have a pull down tap, heat pumps. There's the heat pumps on their front page. You can call and chat with them. They'll, you'll, you'll know pretty quickly if they'd like to do this stuff or not. Um, quotes, the traditional American way is, you know, three quotes. Um, the, the, the business is really busy. And I think if you get recommendations on a couple, you can, you know, obviously, but you can start out with a couple if you want. I'll tell you, if they're very far apart, I'd get a third quote. Um, in Colorado, things tend to be all over the place. I'd be super lost, cautious of low quotes. Um, low being more than like five or ten percent. No, yeah, definitely no more than ten percent below the other ones. Because um, it's just there's sort of no way to really put in a great system without um, really, um, you know, cutting cutting the price way down. Just can't happen. Um, and really online. There's been sort of a proliferation of online wanting to sell mini split heat pumps to everyone. Um, and it's not, it's, not, it's not apples to apples. And here's why. <clears throat> you know, you got a contractor, and you know, I did business for 10 years. Um, if I have an issue or I, I want to really think about it, and I want to be educated, I want my guys on team. I got the distributor backing me up. I got the manufacturer's rep backing me up. I can even talk to the manufacturer. I got this whole pyramid of 
support in the in the state, in the state. And so, you know, whereas online, and I've checked into this, a lot of them are just a warehouse somewhere. Now you might find a contractor who wants to to once will be willing to order from that warehouse and bring it in. But if they have issues, they don't necessarily have this. And I think the big thing is these guys here carry parts. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, this stuff's robust. It'll last, but five, 10 years down the line, a board goes or something like that. You know, you might not be able to get it. You might have to, <clears throat> this guy might be calling some factory in China and trying to get the key component for your heating and cooling system. Um, Couple of things, outdoor unit installation tips. Um, don't, you know, they run, they have some noise. To, I don't recommend putting it near your patio, or under your bedroom windows. Um, wall mounts are nice, but um, you gotta have vibration, insula uh, isolation, um, and they still might vibrate a bit. I wouldn't put it like right outside my bedroom wall. I might put it on the laundry room wall. Um, they do, you know, wind chill can affect it. So I'd avoid strong west wind. The sun helps defrost, avoid the north, southeast corner is good. You can protect them with bushes, shrubs, um, you know, little landscaping things if you need to do that. Um, well, unless you want to get warm by going out and shoveling out your heat pump whenever it snows, um, you know, you need to have it up high in the high country and it's got to be protected. And I, I suggest you look at the height of the average um, depth of the maximum month. You know, so veil, you know, it's got to be a lot higher than say rifle. Um, you're going to have a drain, and you're going to it's going to drain. You want to drain it. Not we've seen examples people drain it to sidewalks that go around the house, which makes it icy in the winter. And then you know you got to protect these lines in the winter. Ask for pictures of insul installations. I mean. Installations like this, like this, like this, you'll know right away. <clears throat> Once you figure out the options of where the outdoor unit can go based on noise, location, drainage, um, then you look at and you know where you want to put it on the inside. If you have a couple of options where to put on the outside, you might want to say, okay, if I put it in this location, it's a long way from all my indoor units. If I put it this location, it's closer. Um, <clears throat> Running these lines properly, make sure they're not sag, they're kinked. If they run them on the outside, they got to have great insulation. You know, they've got to have really good protection. Um, up in the attics, the same thing. And these recessed ceiling units are slim ducted. You know, you want to make sure that they're if they're up in a cold attic. They got to have some insulation around them over them because it'll you know it'll affect the performance. <clears throat> so running out of time, we've gone a little long, but. Uh, summary, you know, this technology works great. Um, you gain a lot of benefits. Um, if you're on these, you're going to save a lot of money on that. If you're on gas, you know, you can run them as a hybrid type strategy. Um, the, the costs will be about the same, but you can achieve other goals. Um, this, this information will go out. You can look at it, you know, Really, if you pick a great contractor, they're going to present different options. They're going to talk about all the inside strategies. If you do that, they're your teammate. Um, and, you know, knowing this information is good. Um, and all these local folks can really help you out. Um, it's a big thing in the high country, and it's really, really great. So that's all I got. Thanks for hanging around for the, for the long, long talk. Thanks, Dave. We're going to ask you a few questions. Uh, the first one, is there any interference from ERV systems? I assume these work great with ERV HRVs. Um, and the second part of the question was um, more specific to the fact that they have a single gas forced air furnace. Uh, the new furnace replacement unit seems awesome if using existing insulated ductwork, and I did encourage him to uh, sign up for next week's webinar exactly about replacing furnaces that are ducted. Right. But do you have any comments on any of that? Um, so the ERV HRV, um, they can't necessarily interfere. You know, the wall units and the uh, like, the floor units. There's really not a way to integrate that but uh with the slim ducted systems you could um actually tap the hrv fresh air into those ducts 
and help it distribute it. So um, <clears throat> often the HRV and the ERVs might be independent of these systems. But like I said, if you've got these small slim ducted systems, um, then you could integrate the HRV and ERV um, air system into it. Um, I, I do need to stress that if, with, um, especially with new construction, really tight houses, um, HRV, ERV, fresh air is essential at this point. Um, that's really important, um, especially like, for example, there's someone I'm working with redoing their basement. They're going to be in their basement. They're, they're going to live ha half the time in their basement. And um, if they don't have an HRV or ERV, they're going to have no fresh air. So I, I hope that answered your question in terms of integrating them. Um, and the, and the, yeah, if you've got, and the next one, the furnace replacement, come to the webinar. I think it's next week. Um, it's a great strategy. I mean, you, there's a hybrid strategy, and then there's a way to go all heat pump um, with your existing duct system. Um, so there's several strategies, but um, yeah, that's, that's an easier way to go. Thanks, Dave. A couple more questions. Uh, is there a software that will model annual heating costs of various fuel technology combinations to demonstrate annual savings? Uh, yeah, Emmanuel J. There's some, there's a few companies that um, produce software. I use something called White Sweet. Um, if you wanted to get into that, you can, I think it's $500 a year for modeling, but uh, a lot of the manufacturers have custom software that models it. So that's when if someone does manual J, depending on what most of the software has the module where, okay, I've got my loads. I put in what kind of heating system I'm going to use. And then it, it, and then it models it out. So then that, that's how you do it. And you basically build the house in the computer and then with the existing house, you can calibrate it um, to, to the, the utility bills. Cause because even though these models are really good, very sophisticated, and you know, not necessarily perfect matches because you have internal heating loads and different things. But yeah, that's the way it works. And that's that's how you do that's how you do a lot of these, come up with these numbers. Um, the interesting thing is the numbers scale. So, you know, like uh, if I go back to one of my slides and like let's just say, um, where is it? Let's say here. So let's say, well, um, you know, Dave, I look, I have a home and I looked at my whole home and it didn't cost me 3400 to to heat my whole home. It cost me 2500 Well, literally, if you just multiply that by, um, you know, 0.3, you'll get what it would be with the heat pump heating because it's just one third. So so you can actually take some of your heating bills and just do it on the back of the envelope really quickly. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, we have a question from the chat here. Um, is the COP, the coefficient of performance, same for natural gas as it is for propane? Yeah, it's basically the efficiency of the units. So if it's like a 96% efficiency, it'd be 0.96. I think 90 would be 0.9, yeah. Thanks. Um, another question here with these new heat pump slash ductless systems, can you essentially do away with duct work? Uh, yes. Well, well, mm, yes, you can do away with duct work or you can greatly, greatly reduce duct work. You know, those mini, so, you know, when I, and that's going to be some of the talk in the new home construction one in the fall is, and I really think the strategy is the moving to greatly, re, I will say greatly reduce or eliminate ducts. So for example, um, if I'm building a new home and I have a second store and I've got, let's say I've got four bedrooms and an office upstairs. Now, I can, that's five rooms total. I can think about doing five individual units, but that's going to be expensive. Um, but I can think about doing two of these um, sort of 
slim ducted with a very small duct system before the rooms, and then my master can do something else. I haven't gotten rid of ducts, but I've reduced the ducts to almost nothing. So it's going to be, the answer is, yeah, it's mostly or nearly all, you know. So that's that's the strategy. And, and the architects will love it with new homes because they, they hate ducts. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Uh, how well will this work with 23 foot vaulted ceilings, not only using propane boiler radiant heat? Now, now they're only using propane boiler with radiant heat. Um, you would want to have some way to do air turnover. So I don't know if you have like, um, I don't know if you have ceiling fans in your vaulted ceilings or something, but you kind of want to have a way to keep that air turning over. Um, so, um, you know, they, they'll, it'll, uh, will it work in cooling? Sure. I mean, it'll, it will cool fine. Um, you know, you put it up and the cool air is going to go down and it'll look fine. Heating, um, it'll just the fact that it's blowing in will mix, but if you really want really consistent optimal performance, you'd want a way to keep keep that air mixing a bit. And that's what I have. I have a house in Denver that they're doing that exact same. They're doing that exact same. They have a they have a heat, they're putting in heat pump. They've already got a ducted system. They said they they don't like, they didn't like the comfort in the great rooms from the furnace anyway. So they put in a big fan and just putting it on the lowest setting and the mixing helped a ton. It even helps in the season where you don't need heat and cooling, like sort of the, the off seasons where, um, <clears throat> you know, might fluctuate a little bit in the day between 60 and 80. The fan really helped a lot. So, Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> And uh, another question here. I have a 2,200 square foot house, basement, main, and second floor. Natural mm -hmm. gas boiler is about six years old and hot water baseboards. Seven kilowatt of, I guess, solar PV. Is it worth considering heat pumps? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I would go for the whole house, but I would definitely look at, um, so I would look at two things. One, like pulling the second floor off, um, the system is really would be easy to do and you get cooling. I mean, I guess that would be my number one question to you is, is there any comfort issues that you care about? Like, do you care if there's cooling at all or not? I mean, my inclination would be to pull a second floor off of the, the radiant system, um, use the heat pump to do that. Um, the other thing, um, but if, if you say, the other thing to look at is your basement um, and potentially um, shut that down. But you won't not necessarily do a heat pump. You could actually do um, a little bit of sort of just, I mean, this sounds sacrilegious, but a little bit of electric resistance heat in the basement. Because it turns out, um, if you've got a really well-insulated basement, um, it hardly uses any energy at all. Hardly any energy at all. So actually, it might not be worth even, it might be worth just sticking with the little radiant in the basement. But yeah, I would look at each floor. I'd say, okay, um, do I want to take off the top floor? Do I want to do the big part of the main floor? And that gets to the slide where just think about what, you know, it sounds like your goal is to try to reduce your gas use. So in that case, I would actually think hard about what are the big areas? What are the rooms that I'd be happy with um, you know, without the radiant floor or the radiant just as a warmer and do it that way. So it's clearly worth uh, looking into. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Um, I want to add that most of the folks you see on this slide here, they're your local resources um, for sharing educational information about heat pumps as well as incentives that might be available for heat pumps. Most of these incentives that are available for heat pumps uh, do require, if it is specifically a heating rebate, for you, it to be your new main source of heat. Um, so even if you have a few little supplemental things, like for example, Dave mentioned some maybe electric resistance heat in your bathrooms, um, as opposed to switching those over to heat pumps, um, that would also that would always be okay. But if, if, to qualify for most of these rebates, you would need to have um, the heat pump be your main source of heat. You could still have a little other heat that's back up. For those who that? have, 
um, specific, uh, I'll go back. Here's my email. If anyone wants, uh, you know, if you got specific questions about your house and just want to have some quick conversations more specific to you, you or your projects, um, feel free to email me and it, it'll be on the, the deck when it goes out. But I do that quite a bit if folks have some questions on projects. And then I'll just add one comment we got, Dave. This sounds like it has cost, health, and climate benefits, and less duck work is exciting. So thank you. <laughs> uh, any last minute questions anybody has before we sign off? Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. Dave, we'll see you next week to talk about uh, furnaces and how you can replace those with heat pumps. Same time, uh, Tuesday next week, and you can sign up. Um, the registration link is on the Walking Mountain website under the calendar events. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Right.